My name is George Loy. There's two things I want you to know about me. In August of 1862, Abe Lincoln called for reinforcements in the military, and I answered my country's call. I served my country. The other thing I want you to know about me is that you'd probably call me a survivor. I survived the war. I survived Confederate prison camps. And I survived the greatest maritime disaster in American history. And no, it was not the Titanic. <laughs> First, I want you to know where my final resting place is. I'm down over the hill. It's hard to see. It's got a small American flag down there. Just beyond this little wall, retaining wall. It's a little too far down and too steep to take you all down, but you're welcome anytime. In August of 1862, I joined Battery D of the 1st West Virginia Light Artillery. You've probably heard it called Carlin's Battery. The gentleman was a colonel in, from Wheeling by the name of Carlin, and he developed an artillery battery that went from Wheeling to the Civil War. We served mainly in the Shenandoah Valley, lower West Virginia area. Uh, fought the war pretty handily, but early in 1863, I was captured along with some of my buddies. We ended up in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, facilities weren't too good. We were in an old tobacco warehouse that had no windows, had a dirt floor, no bedding, obviously. We had to sleep on the floor would gather close to the wall and pile dirt up to make a pillow of sorts for our heads. That was back before they had indoor plumbing like you all have now. So everything was done, our eating, sleeping, and bathroom privileges were done in this warehouse in the open space. As you can imagine, the stench was terrible. At some point, it became so bad that I actually fainted. We weren't held there too long, fortunately, and we ended up at Bell Isle Prison in Richmond, which is one of the, the, the more well-known prisons. Uh, we're still in prison. We didn't get enough food. Uh, we were in cramped quarters. We didn't get enough fresh air, but we managed to survive. At that time in the war, there were frequent exchanges of prisoners. We'd give them a bunch of revs and they'd free up a bunch of our Union people. I ended up back up with Harlan's battery again fighting the war. This went on for about a year and approximately a year later I was captured again with some of my buddies. This time we ended up in the infamous Andersonville prison in Georgia. You may have heard of that. It was designed to hold 10,000 people. When I was there there were 33,000. Uh, when I was there during the year period approximately I was there 13,000 men died in that prison. The conditions were terrible. There was no buildings, period. We were held in a stockade prison. The prison itself had a, what they called a deadline. You weren't allowed anywhere within 10 feet of the wall in the prison, all the way around the prison. If you as much as stepped on the line, you were shot immediately without questions. Of course, conditions were so bad that some guys just took all they could take and couldn't take any more. They stepped on the deadline just to put themselves out of their miseries. There wasn't enough food. There were no, like I say, no buildings. Uh, some guys were able to get scrap lumber and, and build shacks. A uh, few were lucky enough to have tent halves to make a tent. Some were just out in the elements. Everything went on inside that prison, inside the deadline. Fortunately for us, we, we found out that the guy that ran the bakery in the prison was a former Wheeling boy that we knew years ago. And when he found out we were from Wheeling, he made arrangements to have us work in the bakery. So we were able to get outside the prison stockade, and he took care of us. Uh, we got extra food from him. Uh, Obviously, it was better working in a bakery than, than something else we might have been doing. And Mr. Duncan is, was his name. Uh, he left Wheeling, went to, to Louisiana when the war began, and ended up in Andersonville as the baker. He took care of us really well. When some of us got sick, he actually took us into his own quarters and helped doctors back to health. So fortunately, all of us survived. 
in spite of the terrible conditions. As you know, in April of 1865, on the 9th of April, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. A week later, do you remember what happened? Our president was assassinated. Two weeks after that, we were released from the prison and were in Vicksburg, Virginia. All we wanted to do was to get home. The war was ending. We wanted to get back to civilian life. We got on a boat called the Sultana. It was a sort of a perfect storm of bad conditions. The, uh, the boat company got paid per man. The boat was designed to hold 400 people or less. When we got on, it had over 2,000 people. The more, the more people that were on, the more money they made. The boat that left before us only had 800 and it was overcrowded. Conditions were so bad that we, you know, we had nowhere to sit down. We basically, we were standing up most of the entire time. We left Mississippi toward the end of April, started up the river, um, got beyond Memphis, Tennessee, maybe 10 miles. In the middle of the night, the boiler exploded. Many people were killed right away. I was hit in the chest with a board, it kind of knocked me half senseless. And then there was a major fire. So in spite of all the terrible conditions these guys had been through in these prison camps at Andersonville, and a few of them came from Catawba Prison in Alabama, some of them were so weak that they could barely get on the boat. So you can imagine what happened to them when they went into the water. I managed to find something to float with I was floating down the river for approximately three hours, maybe 10 miles. I have no recollection of it whatsoever. Basically, all I know is I woke up in a hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, and was held there for about four days, but I wasn't really in bad physical condition, so they let me go. I ended up back up in Columbus at Camp Chase. We were released and came back home. At that time, I was fortunate enough to find a job as a machinist again. That was my trade. And the story of my life was, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? In my case, I think my glass was overflowing with blessings. I survived so many terrible things, but I endured so many terrible things that I had a hard time dealing with it. I eventually took to drinking to solve my problems. The next thing you know, I lost my job. I went on drinking, went on finding work and getting fired, and that was pretty much the tale of my days. I came down with a major stroke some 10 years later and was pretty much incapacitated. My whole left side was paralyzed. And within 10, 12 years of the end of the war in 1877, I passed away. Like I say, the story was, do I count my blessings? I survived so many things. The, the, the army, I survived that. The prison camps, I survived that. The riverboat disaster, I survived that. I don't know if I told you, there were 1,700 people killed on the, the Sultana disaster. If you remember correctly, there were around 1,500 that were uh, killed in the Titanic disaster. So. The Sultana was the worst maritime disaster in American history. Unfortunately, it happened at a time in history that it got lost in the, the newspaper. The president had been killed. The war was winding down. People were anxious to get back to the life. They were getting tired of hearing all these terrible things in, in, in the terrible battles. And so uh, 